Hello and welcome to our new show, Fewer Calories, More Life. Actually, this is Visual Radio. My guest today is Brian M. Delaney with The Longevity Diet, the only proven way to slow the aging process and maintain peak vitality through calorie restriction. Brian, calorie restriction is something I'm not used to. Well, let's call it the longevity diet. Let's call it life extension and not calorie restriction. It's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a scary term for a lot of people. But if life you do extension. Life extension or youth extension is what we sometimes call it, where you eat in a different way and you feel youthful longer. And you eat in a different way by eating nutrient-packed foods that have fewer calories than a typical container of ice cream or chocolate bar or can of soda. Now, there are a chorus of voices out there um, preaching this. Wayne Green had a, uh, a magazine called CD Review, mm -hmm. and uh, he had some computer magazine too, Computer World, I think, way back when. And Wayne has a book out now about not eating too much meat. And there's another author, Valerie Memonov, who's been on the show, and he's talking about life extension. So that's interesting you bring up that term. You really can't extend your life by limiting calories? Well, this, this is something that researchers have known about with lab animals for decades. This goes back to the 1930s, where someone noticed that a group of mice fed 30, 40 percent less than the so-called control group, where they eat wherever they want, lived 40, 50 percent longer. And at that point, way back 70, 80 years ago, they thought it was just some fluke. But then they kept repeating the experiment with different subspecies of mice and rats, spiders, snakes, fish, all kinds of different creatures. Feeding spiders? They, they feeding, feeding, doing an experiment with spiders. Basically, half of the spiders would eat normally, half of the spiders would eat less. So this, this effect isn't just with lab, with lab rodents. It seems to be every creature that it's been tested in, it seems to work. The problem was that no one had done any studies with humans because we live so much longer than these other animals. It would take over a century to actually prove that it extends life. Correct. That's the, that's the trick. But finally what someone did was they looked at so-called biomarkers of aging, things like fasting glucose levels, even simple things like cholesterol, and did short-term studies in humans and saw that these so-called biomarkers changed after a few years on the diet. So we don't yet, we haven't gone a century, so we don't really know whether or not these people are going to live a few decades longer. But looking at these biomarkers, they're certainly healthier and their risk of getting the diseases associated with aging is much lower. So that's, that's where a lot of physicians and researchers, start, researchers started saying, this almost certainly works in humans. It works in every other animal it's been tested in. Why wouldn't it work in humans? I have a lot of great questions about your book, but I got to go back to the spiders. Maybe you don't know, so I don't want to put you on the spot. What do you do? Do you feed them like mosquitoes? Do you feed them ants? Do they, you know, just... It's an artificial diet. That's a good question. It's an artificial diet. And you see, so, because you have to be able to measure it exactly. So the artificial diet, what are they feeding them? What was it? It was a combination of glucose, um, some kind of cellulose. It was basically, it was really very artificial, as if I recall correctly. So, in S, I didn't realize spiders don't have to be carnivores. They can feed them the stuff. They'll eat something else. Yeah, but they, I think they, 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 might have, they might have mixed in some blood or something. Yeah. Ah, got that, it. That, that, that's a good question. Yeah, I, sorry. I mean, that just piqued my curiosity when you said well, this. Well, and they're so you know. tiny. I guess sort of got to figure it must be tough to work with them. You make sure they don't escape. Yeah, tough job for a lab assistant. This is great information for our audience because who knew that there were the, like back in the 30s, experiments on animals for longevity. Um, well, and even going back to the Middle Ages, there were people who thought this wasn't re really about longevity, it was about cancer, but when someone had a, had a tumor, um, they didn't really have a notion of cancer, they just thought about, you know, there was someone comes in with a lump somewhere in their body. They had this notion that if you give that person less food, because the tumor is less virtuous than the rest of the body, um, the tumor will actually shrink faster than the body will shrink. So the person got thinner because they're eating less, but the tumor got thinner, that is to say shrank, faster. And they thought that that would be a way to cure cancer. So it goes back in humans centuries. And where it worked to a certain extent, they were, they were starving the the enemy disease there. Well, exactly, exactly. And that was starving the body as well. But the, but the enemy disease suffered because it was, they thought of it as 
as less virtuous suffered faster, so it disappeared, and then the person could start eating normally again. And it was less virtuous if you think about that. Yeah, absolutely. Cancer is not virtuous. <laughs> uh, let me ask, Lisa Walford, how did you connect with Lisa and what did your co-author contribute? We connected via her father, actually, who unfortunately died a few years ago of ALS, but he was a researcher at UCLA, and he was the first person to put together all the different evidence that we have, the older lab animal data, some epidemiological data with populations that naturally eat, for historical reasons, a little bit less and a lot of vegetables. He put it all together um, and wrote a number of books advocating that people should try this, and his daughter has followed the diet for years. So we met via him and decided to write this book. What she contributed, we both contributed to every part in various ways, but her main interest is yoga. It's not so much diet, but it's lifestyle, yoga, and meditation. So the parts of the book that focus on exercise, yoga, and meditation, that was her primary contribution. What a great like, strategy to have that synergy. It really, because I, I would have been lost without her writing about yoga. I know nothing. She tried to teach me yoga at one point, and... It's unfortunately not for me. I, I, I love the idea of it, and I want to get back to it, but I knew nothing about it. And she's, she works at Yoga Works, and she is actually a teacher trainer. She, trainer. She's in India right now studying with the world expert yogis. So with yoga, people think meditation. Is medita meditation an important component of a diet? It's an important component. It can be an important component of a lifestyle um, because part of what it is to live healthfully involves much more than diet. It also involves a state of mind. It involves being able to relax, maybe not always being relaxed, because sometimes we have to get work done and we get stressed out with our deadlines, but being able to have a space in your life every day or at least a few times a week where we can relax. That's important as part of your lifestyle in order to improve your health. And there Addictions are lots to of coffee, is that, is that really cool? Uh, you know, it's something I will never kick personally, um, but, uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, it's, 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 it's cool, it's certainly exactly what it is. <laughs> Just so our audience knows, uh, Brian's drinking water, I'm drinking Brugge's coffee, so. I had a lot of coffee earlier, I thought I had too much, I didn't want to come out here and start speeding, <laughs> speeding away, so I figured, alright, I'll go with water for, for one hour. I started a new diet today, today this is the only thing I've, I've had, really, literally, coffee and a little sugar in there, and half and half. Not good. It, it might be good for the soul in some way. might not be great for the body if you kept it up for weeks on end. But dieting it, or, or abstaining from food is good once in a while. It, it, it's good once in a while. Of course, it depends on what you eat when you're not abstaining. But, uh, ah. but, but uh, for, I mean, one of the things we try to stress in the book is that what's good in general might not be good for each particular individual. I think people are so different that it depends on what works for your lifestyle and just for your personality. Some people actually fast. Some people have read the book and have adopted the principles in the book in a particular way that we wouldn't ever do. So they, they actually fast every other day or every three days, and then they eat fairly nutritious foods when they're not fasting. I want to talk a little bit about your life, and then we'll get back to the book. Uh, we're, we're seen in situate. Is that a problem for you? Uh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, uh, you grew up at, at some point in Situate, correct? Yeah, I was, I was born in California. My dad was in the Navy, but then when I was six months old, we moved back. My family's from Massachusetts, so we moved back to Massachusetts, and uh, they went house hunting um, all over the Boston area and settled on Situate. So I spent my first 16 years there. Beautiful area, and you, you're so close to the Cape. Yep, yep. I loved it. I loved it. Your first 16 years, so that had to have a good impact. Uh, it did, actually. I, I regret that I've lost, I just realized, this, listening to myself and listening to you, I've lost my Boston accent. It's tragic. I sound like I'm from California. So I, I, wish, I wish I'd retained it. It's so beautiful. But alas, I sound like a generic American now. You got a great California haircut, too. Yeah, or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Uh, so, Situate, now, did you um, play music in Situate? Well, I did. I, I learned how to play. I started out playing the bass, uh, bass guitar. And, what age? Uh, when I was not as young as I, I, I should have started. I think I was as old as 14. I played a little piano before that, so I knew music. And, um, and then I, I, I loved playing the bass, but, um, but I realized I wanted to play, when I heard Jimi Hendrix, um, I realized I wanted to play guitar. 
like him. I, I never quite got that, that good, but that was my goal. So I switched to guitar and uh, had a couple of bands in situ, and I've, I've been playing music all my life. It's a very big part of my life. I don't know whether or not it's part of the longevity lifestyle, but it's well, part of my lifestyle. I think the cool thing is that you're on DeCapo Press, and they have numerous Hendrix books, including, I think they have a, a Eric Burden biography, too, which Eric, of course, was close to Jimmy. Yep. So uh, that's a, a great imprint for you to be part of, I think. Absolutely. I agree completely. Uh, so did you play in bands? I played in bands in Situate, nothing that became very famous. Um, and I lived in California later and uh, have played with my brother, Matt Delaney, uh, who himself writes a lot of music, folk, folk rock stuff. But when we played together, we played more um, standard rock, electric, electric guitar. Two uh, guitar? Yep, two guitar. Yep. And he sang. I did a little bit of backups. I don't have the kind of voice he has, so I was always in the background uh, with my vocals. And uh, we, we actually played together recently on the Cape, just bars. We just get little gigs and it's... Oh, because he lives here? Yeah, he lives here, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you, you, you still play? Oh, I still play. I will, will never stop. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, so, yep. w w you know, indulge me. What bars did you play on the Cape? Oh, boy, let's see if I remember any of the names. Um, there was the, what the in Wellfleet, um, there's one... Um, well, that's cool. Right on the water, yeah, I don't remember the name. But this year... That uh, this is that, that one most recently was uh, a year ago in the summer. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So, so you get to see the Cape area and... Oh, it was great. It was great. Just, you, you know, local play. bar, you know, get, get free beer, get a meal, and, and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Good for you, man. What, what kind of songs did you play? We played um, some of my brother's music, um, and then we played uh, a lot of covers of um, Grateful Dead, actually. He's a, he's a big Grateful Dead fan. Um, and we played, I think... We didn't play any Hendrix, because um, that was a little bit too much for us, because I had been in Sweden, so we didn't have a lot of time to practice beforehand. And uh, Jimi Hendrix is complicated enough that we didn't feel we had quite enough time to pull that together. But we had played so many Grateful Dead songs in high school, we figured that would be easy. You can always do what the Showtime Hendrix film did, which is they, they didn't play any of Jimmy's music, they played all his covers. Like a Rolling Stone, <laughs> Hey Joe. Right, that's right, that's right. Because <laughs> they, they didn't want to get the, you know, or, or maybe they couldn't get the rights. Oh, so they, yeah, yeah. They did, you know, all along the watchtower, all three chords. So huh. there you go, do the cover version of Hendrix. Doing the cover version of... You can, you can yeah, do exactly. the cover version of Hendrix. That way you just, on a pickup band, do all along the watchtower, you know? That's right, that's right. And it is three chords. That's, that's the, the whole point. But it's three complicated chords, the way he plays them. Have, have Tough you ever, to do it right. It's, well, yeah, the way Jimmy does it. Have you ever written before? Let's give it a little about your background in writing. Before this only... Only philosophy articles, not no, no books. Um, nothing about music. I'd love to write about music at some point. Um, but uh, I actually am, if I'm, if I'm any one thing more than anything else, and I'm not sure I can say that about myself, but I'm a philosopher. I work on German philosophy, so I had written some articles about uh, German philosophy before. And since then, I've done some, um, a book is coming out uh, that I'm co-authoring with a friend of mine in Sweden about uh, Hegel, the German philosopher, in Swedish. We're writing it in Swedish. Because right. we, had, we had translated Hegel into Swedish. So this is our follow-up book to that. Well, that was going to be my next question. How many languages do you speak? Uh, s let's see. There's English, um, Swedish. I, I understand Norwegian. I don't really speak it that well. German, and I'm now learning Spanish. But... But really, Swedish is only the is my only strong foreign language. My other ones are a little bit, a little bit weak at this point. I'm a bit naive in this department. Swedish and, and Norwegian, um, they're not from the Latin, right? As Spanish is and German. Yeah, they're 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 Germanic. They're, they're the Scandinavian branch of the Germanic languages, and and Swedish and Norwegian are very close. If you learn one of them, it's not that hard to learn the other. Um, but they're pretty different from German. But you know, Swedish. Danish, Norwegian, those three are very similar. And Icelandic is somewhat similar, but not close enough. Now, German isn't as hardcore as, as the other, you know, the Romantic languages, Italian, Spanish, but there are elements of Latin in Germany, right? I, there are some. Most of them came in later. Most of them came oh, in, I didn't in know about that. two or three hundred years ago because philosophers thought, and some people say incorrectly, but they thought that there weren't enough native German words to express some of the things they wanted to express. So when you see words in German that end in uh, I-O-N, um, those usually came in relatively recently from, from Latin, um, or sometimes uh, in some other Romance language. Yeah, for people like me, you can write a whole book on languages and, and how they, you know. But philosophy and diet 
it might sound like a stretch to people, but I don't think so. I think all aspects of life, if you're a philosopher. They, they hang together. They should hang together, ideally. They should hang together in some way, even if somewhat loosely in my case. But they well, hang no, not really, because you get the yoga in there, too, and that's, the, you know, and... Absolutely, yep. And what philosopher doesn't practice yoga or meditate, you know? In some way, philosophy <laughs> is meditation, in some way, even if it might not be TM or it might not be anything that anyone in, in Europe or the U.S. would recognize as meditation. It's, it's, I mean, this is what Descartes wrote, meditations. Now, in subconsciously, while you're writing this, maybe some of those elements drift in. Did you intentionally put anything in, or did you just very stay very to the diet point? Well, you know, when we started writing this, since we had different perspectives, Lisa was uh, mainly focused on yoga and meditation, although she knows a lot about the diet, and I was focused mainly on the diet. Since we had these different perspectives, and we talked a lot about the book and the form of the book, since we weren't sure how much of it should be diet, how much should be yoga, um, we, ended up, we ended up talking a lot about some of the philosophical questions surrounding lifestyle choices. And we easily could have written a six or seven hundred page book because there's so much to say about, mm -hmm. about the, the choice itself, about how to live. Um, but we ended up only having a little bit in there because we just thought that, that the, what's in the book now was enough to begin with. And then we might write a book later. Sure, why but the not? Question, the question of the choice to change your lifestyle, be it change your diet, change the way that you exercise, uh, that's a very, very important question. And we address that only obliquely in this book, but it's something that one could easily write another three or four hundred pages about. Because that, that's, that's the thing that I think people don't think about enough. Um, they, someone tells them that they have to change their cholesterol is 300, and they don't think about it. They just make the change or they don't. But it's worth thinking about. Now, in what is the longevity diet? You've got Lisa Walford, and there's information about Lisa, and there's information about you. That's right. Uh, about about how we follow the diet, and especially in Lisa's case, um, a lot about her yoga practice. So you actually practice what you preach? Uh, absolutely, not in an extreme way. Um, when I started this diet, and it started by. Um, I was in graduate school in California, and uh, I went down to Mexico and ate a bad burrito. I don't know what it was, but I got really, really bad food poisoning, horrible food. And I came back up to California. I was in the hospital for two days. They didn't know what it was at first. They thought it might be appendicitis. So they, the guy surgeon was coming out with a knife, and they said, no, wait, wait, it's food poisoning. So I got better. Um, you got to be in tune with your own body before they come at you with yeah, the knife. Yeah, God, I just, I just thought, God, I do not, I do not, it's just getting drugged into unconsciousness and having some guy I don't know cut into my thought, I do not want this. Fortunately, it was not appendicitis. And I got better and... Uh, and kept your appendix at the same time. And kept my appendix, exactly, which is a very good thing, I guess. Who knows, who knows um, whether or not it's really needed. But that's when I started researching um, the diet and started discovering how badly I was eating. I was exercising a lot, but I was eating horribly. And uh, when, I, when I realized, when I learned a lot about nutrition and realized that I was really a classic junk food dieter, junk food American, I realized I had to change. And I explain a little bit about that there. Um, and that's when I um, really made a very radical shift in how I eat. And, uh, and it was not easy, I have to say. I was not used to vegetables. Ah. But I got used to them, and partly because I felt so much better. Now, like, see what you just said, radical dieter, and people don't think in terms of everything they do is diet. Well, but, well, well, exactly. I mean, that, that's, but people say go on a diet. You're on a diet. You're on a diet. People eat things. And, and the, the question is what, what feels right? Um, what kind of diet are you on? Well, exactly. Junk exactly. food diet? Yeah. P someone needs to explain that. Yeah, no, because that's, that's a really good point. When you see this, I think another diet book. All due respect. Yeah, well, that, just coming from me. I, I agree completely, and that's one of the things that we tried to fight against. We we, we, we chose the title because we thought we wanted to emphasize it's about longevity, but and we and, and we, we but we had to have diet in the title. We, we, we because played, people we played around with other things it. exactly, and nothing else seemed right. But but the fact is, we eat. People eat. People who are alive eat, and that means that you're on a diet. It may not be a diet plan that you've worked out on paper on your computer but we all eat. And one of the things we want to stress here is that it's, 
um, it's worth being a little bit more conscious about food choices. The, the thing I was going to say about, about, uh, about my experience in, in California with this food poisoning is that I became very conscious in a way that I wasn't before. I was on a diet. It was Twinkies, haagen a lot of burritos, um, a lot of chocolate. Were which, you this thin on that diet? I w I've always been thin, but not this thin. No, no, no. I, I weighed, I don't know, 15 or 20 pounds more. I wasn't, I wasn't fat, but I was, I was heavier. Um, and, I, and I made this radical change. It wasn't that I went on a diet. My diet changed. And uh, I was, it was a more, a, a more extreme version of what I, of what I now follow. Um, I weighed even less than I weigh now. And I, and I decided that, that that actually wasn't quite right for me. I just didn't like being that extreme. I had to, because I was so, I'm thin now, but I was even thinner. Mm -hmm. And I had to explain myself to people. And that just got to be tiresome. So I thought, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll eat a slightly less extreme version of this. Um, but, uh, but it's still, it's the longevity diet, and I am definitely practicing what I'm preaching. But I'm not really preaching, is another thing I want to say. It's, you know, we want to present the information to people. Um, they can make whatever choices they want. Some people might want to continue to eat exactly the way they eat, exercise or not, the way they've been exercising or not. So people can do what they want, people are free, and we're all very, very different. But we wanted to present some of the science so that people at least know that if they wanted to make this change, they could, and they'd be healthier and probably live a lot longer. Maybe the sequel could be, you know, what are you eating or uh, what diet are you on? Everyone's on a diet. You know, people Discovering say your true diet, the act discovering your actual diet, and then presenting the alternatives. Yeah. People say, you're a writer. And I go, everyone's a writer. You do an email, you're a writer. Good point, yeah. Everyone is a writer today, especially in this day and age, because before you didn't have people sitting at screens typing. They were all conversing. Everyone's a writer. Some are good, some are bad. Everyone's on a diet. And yeah. this needs to, people just really need to be explained things in black and white. How do you get a guy like me, who, who gets not only this book, but I've had people bring their um, workout books. And I go to the gym, believe it or not. Um, and I do regularly, I yeah. uh, but how do you, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there saying, okay, I'm interviewing these authors. I'm a step ahead of the people buying the book because I actually get to talk to you. But still, how do you make it really jump out and scream at them like, you really need this? You know, that's, that's the key. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree, I agree. Getting people to realize that they are on some diet, no matter what, and that we can, we can make that clear to them and make it clear to them that they have a choice. They can stick with what they're on, which is a diet, it's not the absence of a diet, or they can change to something that might or might not work for them. I mean, you say you, you, you read this, you, or you look at the title and you see diet, and it screams, does it scream at you in a way that is, you know, oh my God. For another. me personally, it's, it's negative because I'm on the run. I'm honest with you about it. I'm on the run, I have to do this, that. The other thing, I had to get to the recording studio last night, I grabbed a seafood salad sub, you know, at the sub place, and you know what I have with it, water. But, mm -hmm. you know, that was my diet last night, and then, you know, tea when I'm coming home. And I didn't get to page 68 where it has a microchip screaming, uh, do you feel guilty yet? <laughs> you know, maybe that'll work. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Well, but, you know, the, the thing, I mean, I'm on the run a lot. I mean, I, 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 I'm constantly in motion these days, especially. I, I travel a lot, and then when I'm in one city, be it Boston or Stockholm or New York, um, I'm moving around a lot because I'm involved in all these different projects, music and writing projects and translation projects. And because this is not a traditional diet book where you've got a list of the vicious foods and a list of the virtuous foods, and you have to select things from the list of the virtuous foods, because it's not that, the idea of being on the run and grabbing something, that's consistent with this. You, you ah. just choose, try to choose something that's a little bit n more nutrient-rich than uh, Dunkin' Donuts. But if you, if you partially fail on one meal, you can make it up later. Because this is, the, the idea here is that it's, it's based partly in this lab data that we have going back from the 30s. But it's also based in this notion of how the, we call it the longevity diet effect or the calorie restriction effect would have evolved in the first place. And it would have evolved because during a famine, it would have made sense, you know, tens of thousands of years ago when this effect evolved in humans, or actually it was inherited probably going back millions of years. But during a famine, it's important for 
the species to survive. And the species will only survive if it can slow down its age aging process until the famine's over. And then you go back to the normal business of having sex and reproducing and rearing your children. Um, it would be strange if that effect evolved in such a way that the particular human 20, 30,000 years ago had to eat whatever it be, exactly 1,942.3 calories of broccoli. That if it was a little bit more or a little bit less, and if it wasn't broccoli, it was a couple... You know, dandelions. Dandelions, that the effect, the, all the genes would have shut off permanently. You know what I mean? It wouldn't make sense that the effect would have evolved in such a fragile way. So our reasoning is, and there's some laboratory evidence to back this up, our reasoning is that if, and, and this is how I live, I go to a dinner party and they serve me a fatty steak. I might not eat the whole thing if it's this big, but I'll, I'll, eat, I'll eat some of the fatty steak and then maybe eat a little bit less the next day for breakfast. So our reasoning is that it's, it's the way the overall amount that you eat and nutrients get averaged out over the course of a few days. Ah, see, the seafood salad sub from last night. So that's okay. Because I didn't eat today. That's, that's, and, and, and maybe have a, have a little, bit, little bit more greens for dinner. You're if, right. Yeah. You're right. And uh, I did have a good question, though, about the condition of the world that we're in. And I, I really despise this word ubiquitous because it's everywhere. Ubiquitous is becoming ubiquitous. It's like people discovered it suddenly, right? But Dunkin' Donuts is ubiquitous. And you bring up Dunkin' Donuts, yet I was there last night and you were there right before this show. I was getting some tea. But you were there. I was there, so absolutely. So you're, you're disciplined enough to get tea. Yeah. But the rest of the world has got advertising coming at them, sugar coming at them. And you know what Dunkin' does with the sugar. Oh, yeah. They scoop three in, and I always tell them one sugar. Yeah. I, I, you know, one sugar is fine for me, and that's not a lot. Nope. And the way they scoop nope. it in especially, but I think when you say one, they actually are a little bit more, less generous, because they know you're, you're saying one, you know? Yeah, they know, they, they know you're one of the few people who's trying to be careful. Yeah. yeah, because we do eat too much junk, and at least I'm cognizant of that without, you know, having absorbed all the, the, the people yelling this. Right. You, 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 your book is a wake-up call. The fact that you wrote it, it is a wake-up call. People have to change. Well, I, 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 I think society as a whole has to change. Th there may be individuals who, who enjoy the pleasure of eating to excess, and it may be something they need to write their book or to finish their composition. Many people uh, psychologically are dependent on it. Yeah, and, and, and it may not be such a bad thing. So I, I, don't, I don't want to change every, you know, every, make every person, every 300 million people in the United States follow this diet, but just to present the information um, and encourage people who want to make the change to do it, let them know that it's not as hard as they might think and that really it's so much more flexible, this longevity diet, than the typical diet where you've got the good foods and the evil foods. It really is like grabbing the, whatever it was, seafood. Sea seafood, seafood salad seafood sub. Seafood salad, yeah. Seafood salad sub, that's okay. Eat a little bit less afterwards. A few more, few more vegetables. It averages out. That's, that's exactly how this effect would have evolved tens of thousands of years ago. Where there, there's variation. You go to a party, eat some chocolate, eat some finger food, a lot of finger food. Doesn't mean these longevity genes are going to shut off permanently. It, that wouldn't make sense. Evolution doesn't work that way. Well, I almost went for the hamburger last night. I said, well, I'm in a hurry, and let's eat something somewhat healthy. And, you know, that's probably the better option, although they, they drench it in mayo. Yeah, yeah, they probably do. Although but I had my tomatoes with it. And they put a lot of They put a lot of tomatoes on it, so I knew that was, like, somewhat healthy. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. And, for and men, for men especially. Really, tomatoes? Yeah, because there are some substances in there that, uh, that appear to reduce the risk of prostate cancer. Well, let's, two things I want to talk about then. Men and women eating food differently, and so keep that in mind. And the second thing is it's good that you're here in this forum because I think it's very important that the authors explain what's going on. It, it really is, is more than just, you know, you're, you're here because you're on a promotional tour, correct? Uh, actually, it's, in, it's, not a, it's not a big tour, but yeah, I'm, you're, I'm you're, here, you're, well, I'm here and, and your show is interesting and it's fun to talk to you, so there are a lot of reasons to be here. Yeah. Right, right, but the thing is, I think it's important that people realize like the author comes to life in front of them and, and explains, because the title can't just do it. How can you put it in a title? I agree, I agree. Yeah. So having said that, uh, men and women, 
women um, drink soy. Men drink soy, but there's a lot of stuff for women in soy, right? And stuff that for men might not be so great. The research is mixed on this, but the uh, so-called phytoestrogens, and phyto is just a Latin, Latin word meaning plant, so I don't know why we say phyto, you can just say plant estrogens, but people say phytoestrogens. These uh, chemicals in, in, in soy products that mimic female hormones. Um, oh, they mimic? Well, they, they've tricked the body into thinking that it actually is the female hormone. So for you and me, that might not be such a great thing. And, you know, I found rice milk, and I don't think rice milk has the same effect. No, I don't think there are, there are, as far as I know, no one has discovered phytoestrogens in rice milk. And what I like about rice milk is it's pretty similar to soy milk. It, it pretty much tastes the same, pretty close. Yep. You can tell it's a, drastically different from cow milk, but it's, it's lighter, and it stays longer in the refrigerator. Soy milk will oh, tend right. to sour. Yep, that's right. And yep. rice milk I can have for weeks later. You know, yep. like a week later, it's still good. Yep. I, I sometimes freeze my soy milk if I'm not going to use it right away. Oh, yeah? And then you can thaw it out, and it's exactly the same. It doesn't get freeze or burn or anything. What a great idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you can buy these large economical packages and just have a little bit, freeze it for a couple of days, and then you want, when you want to have more, defrost it. Yeah, see, now, one thing in our household, we're water freaks, so we have the... We have the water, the bottled water, right? And people are like, oh, the ecology, and we're fanatical about recycling. Ah, oh, great. So we're at least fanatical in that respect, and we like our bottled water. Mm -hmm. So it's a little vice where we make sure that we take care of the planet because we like having the bottled water, mm -hmm. and, and we really go through a lot of it. But, you know, we could buy big jugs. We like having the little plastic thing. It's just it's convenient. Yeah, but at least we're, we're um, hydrating, it's mm -hmm. called, right? Yep, yep. Oh, very important. Water is very important. I'm drinking it now. It's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's a change from my normal coffee. Well, I've got coffee and water, a combination. It's, it's exactly. It's novel. <laughs> um, you're really a, a, a fun guest to have. You, you, there's many aspects to you, which is really good. Um, and you're going to be writing a philosophy book, or are you knee-deep in it right now? I'm working on uh, actually a couple of different things. There's a, there's a book in Swedish, another book in Swedish about German philosophy, and then I'm writing a book. I've lived in Europe now for off and on for about nine years, so I'm working on a book on uh, Europeans, Western Europeans' attitudes towards the U.S. That's a whole other story, but that's something as an American, you hear so many things about your own country abroad that uh, I started to realize I wanted to write a little bit about that. And you're bopping around quite a bit. How did you and Lisa do this, by email? Oh, that's a great question. We were actually, we were actually on not quite four, almost four, but because I was almost in, in South America, but it was actually Central America, but we were almost on four different continents. Uh, mostly I was in Europe, and she was alternating between California and India, Asia. Um, and it was all email and Skype. It was actually, it was, it was complicated, but once we got the technical part of it to work, um, we were able to use Skype and talk. Now Skype it actually puts you almost in the room with each other. Uh, that was pretty it was good. A, it was amazing. It worked incredible. Without it, we would have, we would have, I would have had to, wouldn't have been so bad, but fly to India and then fly to California, or she would have had to come to Sweden because it was, email was too slow. Because you know, there's so much, there's a back and forth that we needed. You couldn't send an email, and wait for the answer. And chats are impossible. Yeah, it's really, it's too, it's too slow. I mean, yeah. we both type fast, but it's still, it's too slow. Chat drives me crazy. Yeah, I, I was forced to get used to it. But now that everyone has Skype, I prefer Skype. Yeah. It's faster. Interesting. So, is this your first book? That was, yes. This is your first? Yep. Yep. And how did you go about selling it, if you don't mind? Well, we had, this is the second edition. The first edition ah. came out in 2005. And um, that was with Avalon. Um, this is now with Perseus, the Decapo imprint of Perseus. And uh, the people at Avalon were great. And they, they, um, they encouraged us to, to be independent in promoting the book. So we had to arrange our own uh, book events. So we had a couple signings in Manhattan um, when the book first came out in June, May, late May, June 2005. And then uh, Lisa lives in uh, Los Angeles. So we had a few events in Los Angeles. Um, one was at Yoga Works, where she works and uh, book signing and discussion, question and answer. From Stockholm, Brian Delaney.
sounds good when you're in Santa Monica or L.A. Right? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was actually, it was impressive. I, I've lived there for so long and I didn't realize it, but it's, it's, it's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. All the way from Stockholm. Well, it's true, too. Yeah, it's a, it's a long way to the West Coast from Stockholm. To Boston or New York, it's not so bad, but well, long, long flight. Here's a personal question. Do you read or do you write on the airplanes, since you seem to be on them quite a bit? Great question. Now that I have a little smartphone, you know, one of these little cell phones that's a mini computer, now I do a lot of writing because it has a battery that lasts forever. Oh. So now, now I write. But it used to be read. Ah. And my computer has a, has a battery of battery life of one hour, so that didn't work. Although now they have outlets on some planes, so that helps. You didn't well, bring your guitar on the plane and play, though. No, I, but I used to do that when I was a teenager. Yeah? My brother and I, yeah. Acoustic? Or? Acoustic, yeah. You we, could do that pre-9-11, probably. Yeah, well, especially before, before um, deregulation. Because w with deregulation, what happened was, and this, you know, a lot of people say this is a good thing, airplanes filled up. Before deregulation, airplanes were often flying empty. So my brother and I would get on these planes, and our father was, father was a pilot, so we could fly for free. So we would just show up at the airport, flash our little pass, get on the flight to London with our two guitars. The flight, the flight would be mostly empty, and we'd just have a little concert. Nice. It was great. It was great. Wow. Yeah. Free plane ride to London with entertainment by yourself. It was, it was fun. Good old days. See, these are good questions. And, um, Jimi Hendrix, we talked about a little earlier. So you like Jimi? Love Jimi Hendrix. A huge Jimi Hendrix fan. It was a tra that he died is such a tragedy. You know, he was, he was studying J. He was beginning to study jazz mm -hmm. harmony, and uh, not that he needed to. It was, I think it was instinctive for him. Um, but uh, right before he died, he was beginning to study um, jazz music and jazz harmony, jazz composition. So who knows? Who knows what he would have done? You know, um, you were talking earlier, and you have a, a theory about Jimi microtones yeah well people say people said this actually about about blues and jazz players um, traditional musical especially Europeans back in the back in the 30s and earlier uh, but not just Europeans the, the so-called blues tone where you, you bend up the note um, from the minor third to the major third but you don't go quite all the way um, a lot of ignorant theoreticians said well this is just sloppy it's a mistake not understanding that it was extremely intentional and extremely precise. And some people have said the same thing about Jimi Hendrix. Um, and in his case, it's not, it's not uh, that he was bending up the wrong note, but or that's not what they say. What they say is, you know, he was stoned out of his mind and just didn't know what he was doing. And in my view, that's complete nonsense. He knew, always knew exactly what he was doing. And that what someone should try to do, and I would love, this would be another project. I have too many other projects right now, but it, it would be great to, take his live recordings and look at these so-called mistakes when he's allegedly stoned. And he, and he might have been very stoned, but that's okay. Um, Some concerts, I'm sure he was. Yeah, I'm sure and he was, he yeah. wasn't. But you look at these notes that are alleged to be mistakes, and for example, a note that's between a C and a C sharp, um, and analyze that as part of a microtonal scale that where it's not one of the 12 tones of the white and the black keys of a piano, for example, that's the normal 12 tone scale, but something between one of these two adjacent keys. And try to understand it as an intentional creation of a melody or part of a melody based on a microtonal scale. So not the normal Western 12 tone scale, something else. Um, and I actually think that, that that would pay off that kind of analysis. I don't know if anyone's done it, I've never done it, but I, it would be fascinating to try to see whether or not one could come up with, come up with a logic to these so-called mistakes, that it's actually very, very precise, and it's a note that might be between a C and a C sharp, might be halfway between, might be three quarters of the way up towards the C sharp, and it's part of a microtonal scale that he was spontaneously creating as he was improvising. Maybe have colors in a shade of gray or a shade of red so people could see actually the color correspondent to the Absolutely, to make, to make it more visible. Because, you know, a lot of people, I think the reason that some people said it was a mistake is that they aren't used to hearing some of these notes. They, you know, he's going up a scale and they expect a C or a C sharp, not something in between. And the other thing he was doing at the same time was uh, simultaneously experimenting with feedback. Yep. And how to make feedback sounds that became part of the whole sound and the feed song. Exactly, exactly. That's a whole other area. that people, Some people have written about that, but no one's looked at it as, as, as far as I know. Um, 
looked carefully at the feedback as a pitched element in the music. They talk about the feedback, they talk about the, his technique, but to understand it as part of the melody and the way it, it sometimes matches exactly the key that he's playing in, sometimes it's very different, um, and sometimes is microtonal. Sometimes it's between, certainly, it, I mean, it shifts, so, but um, sometimes it's steadily, the pitch itself is between two notes. Remember the theremin? Yeah. Beach yeah. Boys used it in Good Vibrations. That's the That's most right. famous theremin song. But Lothar and the Hand People actually had named the theremin. I forget what the, maybe it was Lothar. Maybe the theremin was Lothar, but a, a theremin was like this thing. You put your hands and then the, the waves. Right. Yeah. And it would be very random and it would be very hard to play because it's not a guitar, but you'd make random sounds. And yeah. you hear them in Good Vibrations. Uh, Hendrix, right. you're talking about these microtones, and I believe that you, you're onto something. But then he's doing something similar with the feedback, yep. and he's probably doing a combination of the two. Yep. And so you've got three different elements that other musicians were just, he was light years beyond them. Oh, I mean, back then, back then, no one was doing this. And he was so young. Yeah. I mean, this was, this was uh, what was this? When, 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 when did he first play? Well, he played in the early 60s on the Chitlin circuit. That's right, you know, yeah. And, and at that point, no one was doing stuff like this. I mean, he was, he was, he was radically new. Even on the, the, the uh, early Curtis Knight albums that you can hear, you know, with the, the cloudy recording, mm -hmm. you can still, the PPX um, music that's out there, Ed Chalpin's materials, and, and then whatever exists, he's on a Jane Mansfield single, I believe. Huh, I didn't know that. He did a that. single with wow. Jane Mansfield. He did uh, play with Dusty Springfield on her show in England. Wow. And what they Dusty did was, <laughs> I think it's out now, you can go on YouTube and put Dusty Springfield, Jimi Hendrix, and hear it. Hmm. But I think they found the tape, but the tape was missing forever. So someone took like a video off the television or a film, and then someone had an audio off the TV, and they merged them. And this was the only wow. tape floating around for years Wow! of Jimmy with Dusty on Dusty Springfield's show. Wow. In his short three years of fame, he did so much. Yep. So much. It's so exciting just even talking about him, right? Yeah, no, he's, he's great. And it, really, it, really is, it really is tragic that we didn't see what he would have done. But, uh, you know, again, well, one of the reasons I'm bringing him up is because the 40th anniversary of Al Wilson dying is September 3rd, which is like next week. Mm -hmm. Al Wilson was in a band called Canned Heat, mm -hmm. going up the country, let's work together. Mm -hmm. He sang going up the country and um, a second song. See, you, you're sharper than I am. I, I know this stuff and I've got blueheimers. I, I have to struggle oh, I, there. I don't know. I don't know if I'm sharper than you, but... The, but can't heat. Al Wilson lived in the next town over. Oh, he did, huh? And he died on September 3rd, but he was supposed to play with Hendrix on September 4th in Germany. So the manager put Can't Heat on the plane, and they played with Hendrix in Germany. And Al Wilson was dead under the redwood tree or whatever from a heroin overdose. On the 18th, Hendrix died. Yep. And then Joplin on the 4th. So there's this whole conspiracy thing out there on the web. Salvatore Astucci has a book on um, revisiting John Lennon's assassination. and He's got some great conspiracy theories about Al Wilson, Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin all at the same time. Boy, so, I, yeah, I mean, I, mean I'm, I tend to be skeptical of those things, but who knows? Who knows? Well, it's the 40th anniversary, so people yeah. are going to be looking at it. Yep. And um, because he's next door in Arlington, I just thought, yeah. you know, uh, I'd bring that up because he played with Jimi in Germany. Astuccia says Joplin was at the concert. She was recording Pearl. Huh. So he made an error there, and he, and he had Al Wilson dying on the day, September 4th. Wilson died on the 3rd. But other than that, he's got the facts pretty correct, and it makes you think. And, um, yeah, who knows? Certainly in Hendrick's case. Yeah. It was very suspicious. But you're on to Capo, which has a, a number of Hendrix books out, which is really cool. Yep. And, yep. you know. Good, good company I'm keeping. So uh, uh, with, with Avalon... Uh, how did you pitch the book to Avalon? Well, we actually, Lisa, my co-author, had a, had a contract with them with her dad. Ah. Um, and and I'm, I don't know how they pitched that. It may be that they approached, because he was so famous, I think they, they may have approached him. What was his name again? Roy Walford. And what was he famous for? Uh, he was famous for a whole bunch of things. He was famous partly for, um, he discovered um, some a long time ago in the 50s, he discovered some of the key elements of, um, of cellular-based immunity that led to the possibility of coming up with better um, organ donor matches. 
That was one of his, that was his biggest achievement. But then later, he became famous for his studies with longevity. And that's why, that's why he, I think, and he had written books previously about this diet. So I think he was approached, um, so they didn't have to pitch anything. So, but anyway, but he, he unfortunately got ALS. He was extremely healthy um, right up until the end, but then he got ALS. So he was unable to write the book. So Lisa um, found me since I had a nonprofit that focuses on this diet and longevity. Oh, so this was going to be her father's book. That's right, yeah. What an honor for you. Uh, extremely much so, yes. That, that, that really is filling big shoes. Yep. Oh, huge. I, I couldn't fill them. Couldn't do it. But, it's, you know, I, I did my best. Teamwork, no, and you know, here the book is re-released. So when was the DeCapo issuing of the book, the re-release? That was quite recent. That must have been um, in May, I think. And it's 336 pages, so did you add to it? Oh, we added a lot, yeah. Okay. Um, a lot about yoga, and then we, there was a lot of the science. Because part of what we want to do in the book, as I said, we. We don't want to add to this cacophony of voices that we hear in the West, especially in the U.S., telling people they're too fat, they're too thin. You know, we, we wanted to just present the science and let people make their own choices, but the science changes quickly. So when we first wrote this in 2005, um, you know, that was, that was you know, almost five years ago, and the science in those four, four and a half years, the science changed a lot. So we, we updated the scientific background behind the diet. So when you stumble on something, say an article in the New York Times, do you email each other and say, hey, look at this? Or does someone oh, bring oh, something to your attention? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 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 Because it's, 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 we, we want to stay informed. So far, we haven't seen anything that contradicts what we've said. But Great. But we, we want to stay informed about the science as it develops. This book is dedicated to the memory of Professor Roy L. Walford, whose work followed the Enlightenment motto, Dare to Know, and whose life followed his own motto, Dare to Live. Now, is there a biography on him? That's something that I have been working on, and that's why I lived in Los Angeles. I lived in his old apartment in Venice uh, on the beach. Wow. And uh, I've been working on a biography, and it, we, we may publish it on the web because the family was thinking that it could be a, an experimental biography, and I put up the text, and other people can add things, almost like a wiki. We're not, we're not sure about that yet. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working, and there are other people who have web page dedications to him. I try not to say wow or really too much on this show, and I had to have a wow there. You lived in his apartment. Oh, it was, it was great. I mean, this is, a, this is a place where he had parties with, uh, with the doors, because he, he was born in the, in the 20s, so he was, he was a little bit too old to be in the hippie generation. He was the, the, the elder, wise friend to these people who were all hippies in the 60s. And uh, he had, a, he had a, a, a wild, interesting life. And I was there in his apartment, and you, you see he's, he had traveled all over the world, and he's got artifacts from Africa, South Africa, uh, uh, South America. Um, he's got uh, paint, famous paintings. It's just all kinds of stuff. Very we love cool the place. doors. We love the doors on the show. You bring up the doors, and I almost have to digress. Well, I, I'm I, sorry. It's just, you know, the doors. So they're, are they, um, do you have doors records, in, or did you in the apartment? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, then the, the vibe And was photographs, there. photographs, you know, Jim Morrison, all kinds of stuff. So it was, yeah. it was a doors, it was a door, there was a doors section, I believe, a little, of, it was a huge apartment, but a little doors section of the apartment. Rayman Zarek's been on the show, and Robbie, Robbie Krieger did an interview with me, and John Densmore's been on the show, and my late girlfriend dated Jim Morrison. So we had oh. it all covered. Wow. All covered. And we've interviewed Bruce Botnick, their engineer producer, so. Great. The doors are covered well on this. <laughs> I mean, again, like Hendrix, iconic, important. I like talking about you. We just have to brag about the doors. We have to. The, the, the doors are great. And I, I actually, um, I, I mean, I, as, a, as, a, as an element of 60s culture, they were important for what they did. But their music, um, Light My Fire, that's, musically is actually a, an unusually complex song. It's, 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 it's hard to play. The little, the little keyboard intro, which I try to play on the guitar, um, the chord changes are very unexpected because it shifts keys, it shifts tonal centers right in the middle in the chorus. So it's, they, were, they were sophisticated musicians. That's fine. It was never hard for me, but all I had to do was imitate Morrison. I was the singer, so. Well, that, that's, that's, that's fun, but it's not, it's not easy. <laughs> you did it well. It's yeah. impressive. Uh, Morrison, if, you, if, you, if you're in the right register, you can do Morrison. That's about all I could do. And Lou Reed. But <laughs> um, <laughs> do you sing when you're on stage? A little bit, but my, you know, I, I played with my brother so much. He has a beautiful voice, and I does feel he? like I'll, I'll let him. I do the solos. He does the singing. That's our role. Does our, he have CDs roles. out? 
He does. He does. Uh, if you look at Matt, look up Matt Delaney on CD Baby or Amazon.com. Matt, M-A-T-T, Delaney, D-E-L-A-N-E-Y. Oh, and, and you have a website. Longevitydiet.info. Longevitydiet.info, just L-O-N-G-E-V-I-T-Y. Yes. Diet.info, no the. Nope. Longevitydiet.info will give you more information on the longevity diet. And Matt Delaney, does he have mattdelaney.com? Or just do a Google on Matt Delaney music. Music, that'll get him, yep. And uh, so he has CDs out. He has. His most recent one is called A Day in the Sun. And are you on it? I'm, I'm not, I would have, not that one. I would, I would have loved to contribute because there are some great songs on it. But uh, I was in Sweden. And Skype, Skype works for writing a book, but it doesn't work for music. People are emailing files all around. But uh, are you on any of his music? Uh, not yet, not yet, but I think I'll be on some of the next, uh, the, the next CD, I hope. I mean, you know, live on Boeing from, from... Boston to London. Yeah, yeah. live. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be cosmic. I don't think anyone's ever done that before, right? Oh, probably, but it, certainly, they didn't, I don't think that had as much fun as we did. <laughs> Interesting. I usually ask my authors to read from their books. I don't know if you want to. We have only a few minutes left. I'd be happy to, although selecting a passage, I think, would be tough. You don't want to read about yourself, but um, the, the stuff at the beginning is very good. I could read about Roy Walford. Do that. Because he's, he's actually, he's one of my heroes. And there's a forward from Dr. Roy Walford. That's right. Let me, let me uh, in fact, I read his words. We have about three or four minutes. Okay. And we're going to ask for autographs before you leave. And we appreciate, we were going to do a 30-minute show, people, but Brian's such an intriguing guest, honest to God, we extended the show to the full 55 minutes. Uh, great having you here, and when you do your philosophy book, you've got to come back. I would love to. I would love to. This is the foreword that Walford, Roy Walford himself wrote. I have spent most of my professional life researching the relationship between level of caloric intake and longevity. Year after year, I would witness the dramatic results of calorie restriction in my laboratory at the University of California, Los Angeles. The animals eating a normal diet would start turning gray. Their hair would start falling out. Their bones would get brittle. They would start moving more and more slowly, and then they would stop moving forever. While these changes were taking place in the one group, there was a group of mice next to them going through something entirely different. This other group was on the CR, or calorie restriction, diet. These animals retained an astonishing youth and vitality. At an age when most of the mice eating the normal diet were dead, a human equivalent of 85 or 90 years, nearly all of the mice on the CR diet were alive and indeed thriving. The females were even able to conceive. The aging process was slowed so dramatically that many of the mice on the CR diet lived to be a human equivalent of over 140 years, some even beyond 150 years. I was well aware of Clive McKay's seminal research on dietary restriction in the 1930s at Cornell University. His rodents were put on the regime early in life, one in which they were severely and abruptly restricted. Much has transpired since Dr. Richard Weindruck and I postulated and proved in my laboratory that adult onset CR in mice, if done gradually, would trigger the health benefits described above. Stop, stop here. That's great, man. And that's the forward to the book by Dr. Roy Walford. Yep. And it's so good that you and Roy's daughter continued his work. I think it's important for mankind, and I think that's a really good element of this that people probably aren't aware of. I think it's a very good thing to know. I think it's, it's good. I, I think it is good. It is good for us, for us people to know about this. And, you know, people can choose what they want to do. Some people will want to live like Hemingway and drink and eat a lot, and that's fine. Uh, but for people who live don't like know about Hemingway. this. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there, there are people who want to do that. What a nice euphemism. <laughs> well, it's, but, you know, but it doesn't have to be so. If he wrote beautiful literature... And, you know, more power to people who want to choose that lifestyle and who are very productive and thrive that way. But for people who want something else, we thought it was really important to at least present the science and let them know what's possible. There is an element of um, sometimes those people need the spirit of the Hemingway life. Exactly. 
Anyways, uh, as the matrix, the, the oracle in the matrix says, our time is up. Brian, thank you very much for being on the program. Thank you for having me. Um, good luck with the book. Thanks. Well, that's Visual Radio with Brian Delaney on the Longevity Diet. And we'll get some autographs and you're off the hot seat.